This lecture is about multivariate estimation and identification. If you wish to estimate the unknown parameters of a multivariate process, you proceed in a very similar way as in the univariate case, but you just have to be a little more careful with the dimensions. That means that I estimate the mean just as in the univariate case and then the similar thing for the outer covariance. Notice that since we are using the conjugate transpose notation here, this looks exactly the same as our previous notation. I can form the ACF estimate just by using the definition, so I will estimate the outer covariance function, I'll extract the mmth element, and then I'll just scale it with that. I can use the least squares formulation just as I did in the univariate case. As an example, let's look at an arcs p process that looks like this, so it's an IR process with an external input. To get the dimensions right, I have to express it in the conjugate transpose domain, but that allows me then to express it just in the same form as I had before, which then gives me the estimate on the same familiar form as we had before. Notice that the variance of this estimate here is the vec of the unknown parameters looks very much like I had before. Before I had it as sigma squared x star x inverse, uh, and now you can see that the covariance matrix fulfilled this role together with the Kronecker product. Notice also that we're assuming here that p is greater than r, that is to allow this matrix to be invertible, otherwise you cannot invert it because it's not going to be full rank. There are ways of exploiting sparsity assumptions to be able to solve equations like this when you have fewer measurements than you have unknowns, but that we will leave for the spectral analysis course. Proceeding to the maximum likelihood case, I will express a real-valued multivariate process here. The reason for me being real-valued is that the probability density function for a multivariate Gaussian that looks like this will look slightly different for a complex-valued case. There will be a scaling of 2 that will float about, making the notation unnecessarily complicated. The end result, if I did it in the complex notation, will still be the same. So I would prefer to do the presentation here using real-valued data. As you know, the likelihood function will be monotone, so I can just as well maximize the log likelihood, which then looks like this. The parameters here would be the covariance matrix of the noise as well as the parameter sets that I'm seeking. So different from the univariate case, we are now also considering the case when the covariance matrix of the noise is unknown, which is of course the more realistic case. But we begin by assuming that the covariance matrix is known, just to initialize our discussion. Then I can express the log likelihood function like this, and if I compute the maximum of that, this part will not depend on the unknown parameter thetas, so I will, if I maximize it, I will get this expression, will simplify to this. Moving from this step to this step, I use the trace operator. The trace operator is when you sum the diagonal elements of a matrix like this. The trace operator has this very nice property that if you multiply matrices, you can swap the order underneath the trace operator like this. So using that, we can move on to this expression here, where the D matrix is nothing but an estimate of the covariance matrix. Notice that I have y is x theta plus e, so if I to subtract y minus x theta, this is nothing but an estimate of e of t, and then I sum up over all the different ones, I will get an estimate of the covariance matrix sigma. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to minimize the difference between the true covariance matrix, sigma, and an estimate of the covariance matrix. So the parameters theta that are such that this difference here is minimized will be the ones that will maximize the likelihood. Moving on to the case when sigma is unknown, I'm no longer able to omit the unknown covariance matrix, and I need to minimize over both the unknown parameters and the unknown covariance matrix. The easiest way of doing this is that you compute the matrix derivatives of this cost function. I refer you to the book for the details of how to do that, but they are basically lookup forms that you can use, which will lead you to this expression. So the maximum likelihood estimate is saying that you should minimize the log of the determinant, that is a volume measure in some sense, of the estimated covariance matrix. So that means you should try to find the parameter theta such that the residual variance is as small as possible. That seems to make sense. This minimization is often very complex to do. It's typically a multimodal function, which means that the cost function have a form like this in the one-dimensional case that I'm able to draw it, where this would be the global minimum. Notice that there will be many, many local minima, so I need to have a good initial estimate somewhere in this region to be able to find the correct minimum. And this is very typical for maximum likelihood estimates. Remember that my unknowns are matrices here, so the number of parameters is all the elements of these matrices, so I will have many, many dimensions, with each of these dimensions looking something like this, and I would then need to have a very fine grid search to be able to find these global minimas. And typically for maximum likelihood estimators, there's a very high risk of getting stuck in a local minimum. When doing the project, you might well experience this when you try to use the PEM function, even though it might be in the univariate case in your case. You can typically see it by the estimates you get are just making no sense. They're basically on the unit circle or the A parameters are ones and stuff like this. They behave in a way that you would not expect. So the estimate just doesn't seem to make sense. Typically what happens is that you have ended up in a local minimum. If this happens to you, what you can do is you can push the initialization of the PEM call which you're initializing something like this, right? That is saying that the parameters should be initialized with ones and zeros like this. If you just push them a little bit, say that you start them up by this instead, that will probably move you out of this local minima that you are ending up in, and that will probably solve the problem. 
I can proceed to formulate model order selection rules, very similar to what I did before, but of course again now there will be matrices. So this would be an extension of the Jung box Pierce test. Notice that I'm basically estimating the covariance matrix and scaling it by lag zero. So this would be in some sense be the ACF that I used before. And then I'm summing up K of them. So this is basically a sum of the K lowest ACF estimates. The dimension of my chi-square test will of course depend on the number of unknowns, so this will grow like this, but there is a function you can call that simplifies the use of this. I can also form the log ratio test, basically being the ratio between the estimated covariance matrix, determining what is the likeliest point when the residual is turning into white noise. The way this is formulated will mean that the minimum I will find passing the chi-square test will be order estimate plus one, meaning that when as soon as I pass the order estimate, I should move back one step. I'll show you an example in a moment. For the Akaike and the Bic and so forth, the penalty will just be the number of unknown parameters, and instead of having sigma squared, I will have the estimate of the noise power being the log of the determinant, as I said before, this would be a volume measure, and so that will in some sense be a measure of the variance of the total sequence. The way to estimate the covariance matrix is very similar to in the one-dimensional case. Basically what you're doing is you're projecting onto the left null space, and this will now have p dimensions, because you have assumed that you have p unknown, so you scale it by n minus p, to get the correct scaling for this measurement. So basically you're projecting onto the left null space, averaging over the, anything that is in this left null space and dividing by the dimensionality of that null space. That would be an estimate of the covariance matrix. So let's look at an example. Here I have simulated a, a vector AR process or order two, with these being the unknown parameters. I have a thousand measurements of each of the processes. The first thing I do is if I check if there should be the data should be transformed. The way you check that is that you test each of the time series to see whether they are in need of transform, but then you try to make a joint decision. So you prefer to transform both time series and not transform just one if you can avoid it. In this case, I conclude that there's no need to transform the data. I also check if I needed to detrend my data, but there's no need for that. I estimate the ACF and the PAC, they look like this. And two over square root of n is 0 0.063. That means that all my ACF seems to be significant, whereas if I look at the PAC, I can see that as soon as I pass model or two, they turn to zero. You might say to see that there's slightly something here. This is just outside the confidence interval, which was 0 0.063. So this seems to indicate an AR2. I also check the extension of the uh, Gaussian test, which is the multivariate Jack Barrett test. You can call this function to find that out. And these are indeed, the ACF and the PACF are indeed Gaussian distributed, so I can trust my tests. This shouldn't be a surprise to you since I simulated the data using Gaussian variables, so of course it should fit. If I look at my model order test, you can see that my Q statistics will be below the threshold. Here's 15 and the threshold is 102. So you can see that the Q statistic, the Young Books Pierce, seems to indicate they are two. The likelihood ratio test has a cutoff of 9.5. You can see that this would be the first value that is below it. And remember, this one gives you an order plus one. So this is indicating that the order should be two. The Akaik has the minimum of two. The BIC has the minimum of two. The FPF minimum of two. Everyone seemed to agree. So this is an AR2. That is to say that an AR2 is a reasonable structure to use to model the observed data. If I use least square, to estimate the unknown parameters, I can, there's a function ls var you can call. This uh, is the estimates I will get. Notice that this is not all that close to the true parameters, even though I had two times a thousand measurements, showing you that this is quite difficult to estimate these parameters accurately as soon as you hit multivariate processes like this. In general, it is quite difficult to model high-order multivariate processes, and therefore basically all the models you will see for multivariate processes tend to be low-order, and they preferably are AR-based. Here's an example using real data. This is one of the classical examples denoted the mink muskrat example. This is measurement from the Hudson Bay company of the number of pelts that the, the pelt hunters recorded. The system works like this. So if there's plenty of muskrats, the minks will have plenty of food. They'll eat a lot. They will have lots of babies. And of course, that will eat off many of the muskrats. So next year, there will be fewer muskrats and there will be less food for the minks and therefore the minks will not have too many children and therefore there will be not too many hunters of the muskrats and the number of muskrats will grow. So there's a clear dependency between the two where one is the predator and one is the food. This is the way the pelts are looking and of course there's plenty more muskrat pelts, meaning plenty more muskrats than there are minks. And if you check if the data needs to be transformed, they seem to suggest a log transform. So we take a log transform of both sequences. Remember I said you want to transform either none or both of the sequences. The resulting sequences are non-zero mean, so I will subtract the mean and form my new data looking like this. Then I will estimate the ACF and the PACF. Here, 2 over square root of n is about 0 0.25. So if I start looking at this, you can see that if I look at the ACF, it seems promising that this goes to 0. But then if I start looking down here, you see that they are now outside again. So, so probably not an MA. If I look at the PACF, you can see I'm having something here. So, But this is a very small number. So maybe I should get away with an AR1. Then I have something here. So maybe an AR4. Maybe an AR2 should be my model. And then they are all small, right? So, so AR1, AR2, AR4. Four. Recalling our KISS rule, that means that we should try the AR1 first and then move on to AR2, since this value here is quite close to the confidence interval. 
If I do that, I can conclude that an AR1 doesn't work. So I will therefore say that, of course, this value here was significant, and I will then try to use an AR2 model instead. If I look at my model order estimates, on the other hand, you can see that they are decaying. The Q star seems to be just decreasing all the time, so this is not going to give me a reasonable estimate. Same thing with the Akaiki, it's just decreasing. The BIC suggests an AR1, the FPE seems to suggest an AR4, whereas the MPE seems to suggest an AR2. So the threshold is 9.5, and remember that the first one that passes the threshold is the order plus one, so that's why it suggests an AR2. What you can see is that the big estimate seems to suggest that both an AR1 and AR2 are basically equally good, and our earlier conclusion that an AR1 is just not good enough then seems to suggest an AR2, and this is the estimate I'll get if I try to model it using an AR2, and you can see that my model fit so that is what my model seems to suggest in blue, this fits extremely well to the data I've observed. So good indeed that I would suggest that this is an overfitting, that I'm fitting it too well. The only part that's not fitting are the initial conditions that it cannot handle. You could deal with that by estimating the parameters forward and backward, doing your filtering operation forward and backward. But this is just to indicate that an AR2 seems to be as accurate as we go, and that is just too many parameters likely to be able to describe this data well, since I seem to fit it perfectly, all too, for, too perfectly, I would say. So concluding on the estimation of multivariate processes, it, this is in general quite difficult. The model order selection is tricky, and the variance of the estimated parameters are high. So you have to have a good reason preferring a multivariate process model instead of using many inputs to a model, as we discussed before. But there are clearly cases where there is an interdependency between the measurements. So for instance, the temperature in Sveedal and Stulop, as we discussed in the lab, one is of course not an input to the other, so there would, would be likely to model them jointly. One way of doing that would then be to take care of the trends and, and structures and cycles separately, and then to model them jointly. That would also be a way of proceeding.